Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 723 of Long Box Heroes, the Lamborghini of comic book podcasts. Joe and Todd here. Todd, hello. How are you? I'm doing great. Had a lot of fun between the After Dark and this show. Mm-hmm. Good times. Under dollar level on the Patreon. I didn't put up the one from the actual Patreon this past weekend, but uh, it'll be a double drop this weekend for the $100 and up Patreons. There you go. That's what I like to hear. People will message me and say, there's five Fridays this month. Where's my regular show? <laughs> I could say, I don't know. Sign up for the $100 level. You're going to get tons you go. of stuff. There you yeah. go. It's our five Friday thing, like the five Friday, uh, the five Wednesday month for comics. Yeah. Yeah. We have the event. We have the event every, every month. So uh, I'm not one to watch the clock, Todd. Of course, we talked a little bit beforehand. Um, but I don't have to watch the external clock because we're going to be racing against the internal clock Mm -hmm. because I'm coming down with something. It's definitely allergy related. Uh, but I took some NyQuil before we started recording. So clock is ticking, ladies and gentlemen. There you go. (laughs) Uh, so let's get into it. We have some news stuff to talk about. We have, um, printing mishaps. More delays, not from DC this time, surprisingly. (gasps) Uh, They get a reprieve. Um, The change in distillery and their distribution. And one of Todd's favorite things outside of bird law, and that would be superhero law. Right. Uh, We have conventions this weekend, and it's a big weekend of conventions. We have uh, Becky's My Walk Down Lois Lane and uh, Todd... Lois Lane is dead. Shocked face emoji? All right. Uh, We have what we read from this past week, which would be Uncanny X-Men number one and Absolute Power number two. We have what we're looking forward to coming out this week. Uh, We have our continuation of Todd and Joe Have Issues, where we're rereading all of Gail Simone's Secret Six. We have another reminder that we forgot to do over on After Dark, because there is a different audience that listens to After Dark than there does on this show, uh, in regards to the pigskin pickums for the Longbox Hero Pseudomedia Network, Umbrella, Arm, etc. And uh, we're going to wrap up TV talk with the rest of Batman Cape Crusader from Amazon Prime. I did watch a big chunk of it this weekend. I didn't finish it. I got two episodes left. Uh, but I watched the last two episodes in a bar with the sound off, and I think the go- I got the gist of it. Yeah, um, I will say this: the last two episodes are pretty much a two-parter, so without any spoilers, they kind of go together like hard. Yeah, two-parter about a man with two faces, maybe, maybe. And I will say this about what we're looking forward to this week: I think loyalties will be tested this week. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, again, we're you know we're gonna get into it. Like I said, I don't. I uh, well, you know, we'll get into it when we get into it, right? Right. All right, so um, Mad Cave did a blank sketch cover for their recent Flash Gordon book uh, by Jeremy Adams and Will Conrad. And this is not the first time that this has happened, but this is the first time that it's happened to Mad Cave, um, Mm -hmm. where they use the wrong kind of paper on the blank cover. The intention of the blank cover is that you could take it to an artist and have them do a sketch on it. If you yourself am a burgeoning artist... Uh, you do a sketch on the cover, but it's to have somebody do a sketch on the cover, right? Right. But they use the wrong kind of paper for the cover, and now you can't write on it. Or you write on it, and it just, like, smudges. Right. Um, um, and then, you know, then it runs into a situation where, like, okay, of course it's returnable. Um, they're not going to... Uh, they're going to do a rerun of it, but then when you have something like this become returnable and the books are recalled, then the recalled versions end up being worth more than the new versions. It gets to be a whole mishigash. I just feel bad because, like, Mad Cave's now out that printing cost, you know? Yeah, and I've never been a fan of sketch covers. Like, for for personal reasons, like, do whatever you want with them, people. But there's a lot of artists, even when they get the pap- the right paper that they use for mm-hmm. sketch covers, there are plenty of artists that don't want to do them because they just say even the good sketch cover pa- uh, paper is 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 god-awful. I know one from like talking with uh, Mike McCone. Mike McCone, 
who I, you know, have been, you know, hung out with and talked to. He's like, God, he's like, anytime somebody brings me, I, I just beg off. You know what I mean? Like, please mm-hmm. let me put, do it on my own paper, you know? So, you know, but, I know D- DC is the ones I think who had originally started doing them. I don't know who did the first sketch cover to tell you mm-hmm. the truth. Um, I, I, I feel it was DC only because there was a couple times where it was, you know, pre Asa, because that's how long ago this was, mm-hmm. where we were still regularly going to cons and stuff. And I knew like so and so was going to be at this con because they're always at that con. And I'll have the sketch cover. And like it was, it was like uh, Balthazar and Franco, right? Mm-hmm. And because they charge so little for their sketches, there was a couple of them where I'm like, oh, here's this one. It's like a Harley Quinn or it's a Flash or it's a Batman. Could you do the sketch on this? And I have a couple of those. Okay. Yeah. Like they were purchased with an intent for like a specific artist, I guess you would say. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, I'm trying like now, if you count the first, like I think what becomes the first blank cover, Mm -hmm. but it's not meant as a sketch cover. And we're at the 30th uh, anniversary of it is zero hour. Issue zero because it's the covers keep like getting wider and wider until there's like the world, the universe is destroyed. And that kind of kickstarted like that probably got people to draw on it. But then the the first one that was kind of done with blue lines and somebody on the cover saying, hey, like this is you can draw on this blank sketch cover was Gen 13. In 1990, I don't have the year on that, but then uh, Billy Tucci does it with Shy as uh, an art war tour book. So uh-huh. like, that's very interesting, you know, that that's the the, uh, the evolution of the sketch cover, if you will. Right. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, look at that. We, we teach you here on the show. We are very educational. Yes. Now, I know in the news tease at the beginning, I said it was a delay uh, that cannot be ba- blamed on DC. I should have said cannot be blamed on just DC okay. because the DC versus Marvel omnibuses have been delayed yet again. Right. They were originally supposed to be out last week. When we first started talking about this coming out months and months ago, the original ship date for them was August 6th. They are now pushed back to the first week of October. Both mm-hmm. of them. The one that does like the pre Amalgam stuff and the one that does the 90s DC vs. Marvel Amalgam stuff outside of the stuff that was written by someone who did a lot of bad things. Which I think is what's tripping all this up. You think? Yeah, I think them pulling that back when they pre- like solicited it, screwed up print whatever like contracts rights having to re-go through stuff and reformat whatever that it, it just keeps keeps getting pushed back somehow that's my opinion but i'm king of the uninformed opinion so <laughs> uh so yeah so again if you're waiting on them you know i apologize when we if if you get your comic news from us that's what we're here for we try to keep you informed on stuff that we've talked about before or stuff that we've gotten a response from you before Mm -hmm. or something right right uh so again maybe they'll be up by the end of the year what comes out first that or uh issue 12 of jeff john's current jsa run so you said it's what October for October eighth as it stands right now. Oh, definitely this. Mm-hmm. This I think JSA is going to be. Su- I don't know now you, whether you're talking about Jeff Lemire's JSA or Jeff John's JSA. I'm yeah. so confused, Joe. Right. And oh, you know what? Just as a follow up, uh, you know, I did. I don't know if we mentioned on the show. Uh, you know, we mentioned on the show. Toward the end of, and it's good enough to put it in here because we're talking about books, we're talking about October, we're talking about whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Um, from what we read last week, and this will be all over the place, uh, I read that Dan Waters, Dexter story that was in the Super Pets book. I have a feeling you didn't like it as much as I did. No, I liked it very much. I thought it was very good, even with you hyping it up ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I kind of knew what to expect, but just the way that the story was told, I thought was very well. And that definitely does earn, uh, the little note that I had on Nightwing for October on the spreadsheet went away. (laughs) 
Oh, okay. I'm really glad you like it because I I couldn't not hype it up by giving some of the information away. Yeah. But uh, you know, because it was like, oh, I got to get you know try to get people to to read it. But even just as you were saying, thinking about it, there are little bits and pieces I'm thinking about. Uh, and I'm getting goosebumps because I really, I really, really like that story. And do you see how I, t- uh, I said that it has a very like uh, Sandman fifty Ramadan feel about it, with like the way the word balloons were in the sky, like that the the narration was in the sky, and I don't know, it just looked very much like a P. Craig Russell thing to me. Mm-hmm. That's that. Uh, so another thing in regards to some distribution stuff and we always talk about this and you know obviously we'll end up talking about us and how this affects us but we did a story here a couple weeks ago that distillery who is a new up-and-coming publisher um i know there was one of the books that you were reading from then the blood brothers mother's Mm -hmm. book was from them yes uh that was a flub on my part where i'm like oh it's an image book and i couldn't find it on the the image pull list, and that's because it was from uh, Distillery, right? Mm-hmm. So Distillery recently just flipped their distribution from Lunar to Diamond, right? Right. Um, now, because of that, and we talk about this all the time, and we all uh, we we do our best to say like Lunar and Diamond, and then you have Penguin Random House, right? Right. And then we try to be as clear in regards to like where these other things go to, like Diamond is previews and. We kind of sometimes neglect that Lunar is also DCBS, Discount Comic Book Shop, and In Stock Trades, which are two different online versions of ways that people get comics online. Right. Okay. So if you were getting your books, your distillery books, through DCBS, this week DCBS contacted you and said that the distillery books that you ordered through us – were canceled by the publisher. Which they weren't canceled by the publisher. They're just no longer being distributed through Lunar. Right, they were canceled to Lunar. They were canceled to Lunar, and Lunar had to send out a press release essentially saying like, hey, uh, you know, folks that were getting our stuff through Lunar or any of their channels, if you were contacted by them saying that the books that you were getting were canceled, the books themselves were not canceled, just our dealings with them is canceled. Here's how you could reorder your books and everything else like that. So do you, Todd, feel as though this was unintentional by Lunar DCBS in stock trades? Or do you think that this was intentional in the fact that they told the uh, the people that were buying the books through them that the publisher canceled the books, not them, And they did not give the people who wanted those books another option to get those books. My heart cries unintentional. Yes. But my brain says slightly intentional because I'm going to go unintentional. I know I'm flip flopping here, but because if you do and you just straight up lie and you still have to deal with these retailers for some other books. And you know they're going to find out that these books are available somewhere else. Like, even if you're a terrible retailer and you don't, like, look around or look into getting these books, it it's going to trickle out somehow. Some fan, some customers are saying, I saw these on eBay. I saw them here. I saw them there. And it's going to be like, you done me dirty. Do you know what I mean? Like, whatever I can get from somewhere else i'm gonna and i'm only maybe gonna use you because i get very confused on you know the the territories when it comes to books it's like i might have to use you for these three things so i will but everything else i'll go to the other ones where they they overlap if that makes any sense it's bad business joe Mm -hmm. it definitely feels like bad business i don't know when comics became a business but it's bad business yeah uh, so last but not least, this is something that you wanted to talk about, and this is the trademark mm-hmm. for superheroes. Right. I, I just find them using that Marvel and DC, because this is what's happened. They kind of like say they have a trademark on the phrase superheroes, and other people were fighting it. And it, like it was came time to re up or file paperwork and Marvel and DC have kind of forgotten 
or they didn't do it in time. So they're like, oh, it's defunct now. It's blah, blah, blah. But I ju- it, it reminds me of like when Marvel was trying to trademark X and they're like, no, 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 no. You can't trademark a letter like the letter as uh, as it is, even though it seems like they kind of could, but like other people couldn't use superhero. And they're like, no, it's a genre, not a, a thing. And I'm of the mind that I just think it's like super hysterical what these big like companies will go through to do this, where you should just be able, if your character has superpowers, you have you have the superhero and i don't understand like the complete legal ramification of what you can use it and how you can't use it but dc and marvel i'm sorry no you can't you you can't you can't own superhero the phrase if that makes any sense so here's the weird thing about it and shout out to uh rich johnson over at bleeding cool this is where we kind of aggregate a lot of the stuff that we talk about on the show Mm -hmm. um so his researcher in regards to this story, and was it Rich himself? I'd like to give them credit if it was. Yeah, it was Rich himself. So he went through the litany of times over the last almost 30 years that Marvel and or DC opposed somebody using superhero or some sort of variation therein of a trademark, right? Mm-hmm. Now, most of the times that they did so, it was a lot of times for something unrelated directly to comic books. Like there was a soft drink, there was a um, uh, a charity, there was all these different little things that they did. But what would happen is the person or the entity would use superhero in some sort of trademark filing, whatever. Marvel and or DC would oppose the trademark. And then more times than not, they would just give up the battle, Marvel or DC. Would you be like, we just want to kind of show you that we own this? Mm -hmm. Now, there are a bunch of instances where they pressured people into dropping it and changing to something else. There's a few instances where the person decided, like, okay, we're going to take this to court. And then Marvel and DC ended up taking that trademark in particular, like this one here. 2007, a trademark for Superhero Sam was filed for charitable funding. The trademark was opposed by DC, and in 2009, the actual trademark was transferred to DC. They own it now. (laughs) Okay. So that's the rare instance of things, but it just really does feel weird at this point that Marvel and DC, not that they have it, but the fact that they're willing to fight the little guy over it. Sure, because they have lawyers on retainer, man. They're paying them whether they do nothing or something, you know? Yeah. But that would be like Clint Eastwood saying, I own the rights to the phrase Westerns. Do you know what I mean? Like, because I've done, I'm iconic for it. It just, Mm -hmm. it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem right. Even though I would give it to him if I was the judge, but that's neither here nor there. It's just it's just crazy to think that there's a you know companies that, like that's the one thing that Marvel and DC throughout the last fifty years could agree upon that mm-hmm. we're the only ones allowed to use the term superhero. There you go. Finally, common ground. Right. Ah, <laughs> uh, so uh, we got conventions this weekend, and there is a bunch of them. Uh, we've got GalaxyCon in San Jose, California, if you're out on the left coast, as it were. Uh, big selection of folks there. Art Adams, Joel Jones, Humberto Ramos, Dan Jurgens, Fabian Nicienza, Carrie Nord, and Weird Al. I saw Weird Al was at Steel City Con. So, for whatever reason, back half of 2024, there's a very good chance at a convention you can meet Weird Al this year. I'm going to get my VHS of UHF signed, Joe. Yeah, oh, that'll be good. Uh, then we have one that you're a fan of, one that you've been to before. That's Terrific Con that's happening in Norwich, Connecticut this weekend. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a big, heavy hitter one. And again, there's reasons why I'm not ending with this one, even though there are a bunch of heavy hitters at this one. Uh, Jim Lee, Mark Wade, Greg Capullo. Scott Snyder, Scotty Young, Jason Aaron, uh, Brian Azzarello, Mark Bagley, Eric Larson, Walton Louise Simonson, and friend of the show Kyle Starks is going to be at this one as well. 
Yep. This one is I'm actually sad I'm not going to because two people, uh, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez is going to be there, and I'm always a big fan of his. Mm -hmm. And then a doctor I've never gotten my photo taken with is going to be there, and uh, the seventh doctor. And I was like, oh, I wanted to go, but it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to. Oh, well. You want to you wanna come to DabbleCon with me? You know what? Oh, I just came on down with three-hour COVID, Joe. No. <laughs> but it's delayed three-hour COVID. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, also this weekend uh, in Fairfax, Virginia, the Fairfax Comic Con is taking place. Mm -hmm. uh, Jay Lee is going to be there. Um, Jimmy uh, Pamiotti and Amanda Connor are going to be there. Right. And I very rarely do I mention this, but from the world of sports and entertainment... Uh, Willow Nightingale is going to be there, current AEW superstar, former uh, LVAC superstar is going to be there. Okay, I don't know who that is, but... Uh, one, of the, one of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet in the history of the world. Right, Too right. nice for this wrestling business of ours. Mm. And uh, Axe and Smash of Demolition are going to be there. Demolition? Okay, I was thinking of somebody else. I was thinking of Legion of Doom, but... no. They're, They're all both, doing uh, no longer with us, sadly. Oh, okay. And I know for no amount of money <laughs> would uh, Barry Darso, who is Smash, will he don the Repo Man mask anymore, sadly? Oh, that's who that is. Yes. I only know him as his the best, the one of the best gimmicks in wrestling as Repo Man. Yeah. Repo um, but I right. bet you, if you go to that convention, uh, you could bump into friend of the show, Kevin Ford there. Tell Kevin I said hi. Yeah. Um, and the last one that I want to end with uh, is Fan Expo Chicago. Those fan expos don't make any money, Joe. Okay. So Only one of them. One of them does. Well, uh, you know, they got some, you know, they got some big name folks here at this one. Uh, you know, even though there's tons of big name folks out at some of the other conventions this weekend. Uh, Andy Kubert, Patrick Gleason, uh, Pete Tomasi, Jeremy Adams, Nicola Scott is going to be there. And their big media person is Mark Hamill. Oh, that's a big get. Who don't do much of anything these days, like publicly, pub, publicity wise, you know what I mean? Yep. So that's a big one. Now, I saved this one for last for two reasons. Okay. One, um, I guess last week's Fan Expo, wherever it was, there was an incident. And by incident, I say part of the thing that you could pay for to get. Um, by going to Fan Expo, because it seemed as though the Fan Expo folks had a deal lined up with the Ghost Machine people. Jeff right. Johns and all his folks, right? Mm -hmm. Now, not all of them are going to be at this convention, but some of them are. And all of them were not at last week's Fan Expo, whatever last week's Fan Expo was. Right. And what they did was they gave you the option... To say, okay, give me a full refund, or give me a partial refund and just send me all the swag I was supposed to get, mm. or transfer my fan expo experience from last week to Chicago for this week. Right. I don't think they're going to Chicago now either, to tell you the truth. Right. Well, and that's the thing is, uh, not all of them are going to Chicago. Mm -hmm. Some of them are, right? But not all of them. And not a knock on a lot of the other folks, but I, I feel as though a lot of folks were probably looking to meet Jeff Johns as well as everyone else. Right. So I if he's I, getting that JSA done, man. That's the only thing that I could hope, right? <laughs> is that's what he's doing. Trying to get it in before the Lemire run starts. <laughs> and um, that Amalgam book comes out. Yes. So, you know, it just, you know, I didn't see that one making the rounds too, too much, you know? Mm -hmm. Which leads me to believe that maybe not a ton of people signed up for the full Ghost Machine experience. Or maybe a lot of the comic book medias are in Ghost Machine's pocket. Okay, that's another, yeah, that's another uh, option, right? Allegedly, you never know. Like, please don't, please don't report on this, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's all. Now, I mentioned that. But I also mention, and again, very rarely do I do this, but next weekend, Fan Expo is, uh, next weekend is Fan Expo Canada mm -hmm. in the greater Toronto area. Right. And I have it on good authority that Cardiff Electric is going to be there. 
Oh, you going? <laughs> no. Fire it does up. seem odd that he would go to one in Toronto when he lives in Minnesota. Mm. But who am I to argue? Um I may have been trying to convince him that he should apply to get a table to sell, like, his wares and stuff there. Right. And I may have also told him the secret of how to get press passes. The what? <laughs> to get press passes. Oh, I, I wish we knew that secret. We do know that secret. Mm. You tell me there's a convention you want to go to, I do the thing. Oh, that's right, yeah. The only one we've ever been denied for was um New York. Right, right. That we tried for and were denied for. Let me emphasize that. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, But we'll have the links to all of these conventions in the show notes, uh, along with information about Soon To Be Named Network at soontobenamednetwork.tumblr.com. Anytime any of the shows in the network go live, of course, you can find them at their own individual websites through the podcatcher of your choice. But the one-stop shop for all the shows in the Soon To Be Named Network is... Soon to be named network.tumblr.com. And of course, that includes this show that you're listening to right now Longbox Heroes, Longbox Heroes After Dark, Puzzle Warriors 3, Profane Arguments, Wings on Wings, Porch Talk, We Need Wrestling, Final Wrestling Place, At Oz with Wrestling. And if anyone from those shows appear on any other shows and they let me know, you will find out about it over at soon to be named network.com. Dot .tumblr.com. Now, Todd was kind enough to let me know that friend of the show, contributor to the show, uh, young Becky, is going to be on something called Free Quills. Yes, I think. Some, something about getting free writing utensils or whatever it is. Right. I think her episode drops this week, but don't worry your pretty little head about it. It'll be up on soon to be named network.com. Soon to be named network.tumblr.com when the episode goes live. Sweet. Right. Uh, Be sure to check out in the show notes, of course, uh, links to some of our friends and stuff that they're up to in and around the world of the internet and comics. Go check out Mike Sterling's blog over at ProgressiveRuin.com. Go check out our friend Kevin's blog over at HellionsTeam.com. Go check out Rick Williams' The Chop Shop at FreeKarateChops.StoreEnvy.com. Jason Sandberg's Jupiter is still available for purchase a la carte through his Indiegogo. Um, One day, I hope we get the exclusive when the second issue of that comes out. Uh, Hmm. Chris Runt's Battle Monsters is still available at Fortress of Comic News, uh, his website. Our good friend Davey of the band Cave People has his own self-published books over at cavedomaincomics.com. Uh, nothing new there, but you can certainly pick up uh, print or digital copies of Mending, and it looks like Keeper is back in print as well. It was out of print, Ooh. physical print for a while, but it's back in print now. Nice. Um, and if you do not have a comic book store in your area or you do not have a good comic book store in your area, let our store be your store. Comics on the Green, we have the Facebook page linked up. When the new books are in, Dave and the crew will let you know. There hasn't been any delays in a long time, but if there is, that's how you find out. You want to find out when the for- final order cutoff date is for some of the latest and greatest comic books that are coming out here in the near future. You want to be on top of the all-in DC stuff. Dave and the crew will let you when the absolute last day that you could put your orders in for them will be. Sign up for the mail order subscription service, whether you get your books mailed to you weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. There's a chance you can get a sketch on the package from our good friend Becky, who we're going to turn things over to now for my walk down Lois Lane. Welcome back to my walk down Lois Lane. Today we're going to talk about a Superman. Let's cover Superman 215 from 1969, so let's dive in. Lois is dead. (laughs) The story begins at Lois's funeral with Superman standing beside their five-year-old daughter, Lainey. Lainey has her father's powers and her mother's temper. After the five-year-old tries to jump in her mother's grave, Superman tells her, don't bother, there's no body there, because she died from Dimension Master breaking into their house and hitting Lois with an atom dissolver right in front of Superman. Lainey says she's off to go smack around Dimension Master a little, and Superman tells her it's not worth it. He takes her to the Fortress of Solitude to spend the next year training and playing with his daughter. 
It's actually really cute. They have panels of them building giant snowmans, her riding around on crypto. It's, it's adorable. For the one-year anniversary of Lois's death, Superman builds and gives Lainey a robot of Lois. He says it's to help Lainey grieve, but when the little one is asleep, Superman keeps making passes and dates the robot until he sees an article in the paper reminding him that Lois is dead. The robot breaks down, and then so does Superman. <laughs> Back at the planet, Superman is asked to judge the local beauty pageant by Perry as a scheme to get him a new wife. Superman gets there and says all of the women here are nothing compared to Lois and what he had until he spots a contestant that looks exactly like Lois. He scans her with his x-ray vision and sees that she has the same broken arm Lois once suffered and runs up to her delighted. He tells her he's so glad that she's alive, and this must have been a temporary ray, when she shifts and turns into this hideous woman. Lois is still dead, and this is the Chameleon Queen. She works with Dimension Master, and decided that messing with Superman into making him think his wife was alive would be a really funny prank. He goes outside to see Dimension Master, who tells him that he knows he can't kill Superman, so mentally breaking him is just a really funny thing to do. When Chameleon Queen and Dimension Master are pointing and laughing at Superman, a ship comes down from the sky, blasts Chameleon Queen and Dimension Master, and kills them both. The ship settles down to expose Lex Luthor and Brainiac. They tell Superman that they might be a bad guy, but Dimension Master's plan isn't how you fight Superman. This is in poor taste, so they killed them and they're off to dump the bodies with Superman's blessing. Part one of this story ends with Superman returning home to be with Lainey. So this What If has a part two, and I will tell you all about it next week, so tune in for more. Thank you, as always, Becky. This is a fascinating one. <laughs> you know, they say that Superman has a lack of good villains, but when is the last time the Dimension Master appeared in something penned by Joshua Williamson? If Now, if Dimension Master is the villain in Jason Aaron's All-Star Superman or Ultimate Superman or Absolute Superman, whatever it's going to be called, then I will eat my hat. I have a really good feeling that it's not going to be. You never know. Um, I'll say this. I honestly thought it was Japan who first built a certain type of robot. But hey, it was Superman building the Lois Lane one. Interesting. <laughs> I like that this, the robot was so well built that it tricked even Superman himself. Oh, good stuff. <laughs> Sometimes uh, it's a two parter. So we get to find out what happens next week here to uh, Lois Lane. Yes, we do. And thank you as always, Becky Todd. Let's get into what we read Wait, from the past second. week. Oh, uh, the thing that I mentioned before about questions. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, I'm not even going to clean this up. I screwed up. So, um, hey, if you have stuff that you want to know about, like, this era of comics, or if you have something that, like, Becky hasn't covered yet, a lot right. of times when stuff comes up on the show that's not Lois Lane related, um, it's usually because myself or Todd have mentioned something to Becky, and mm -hmm. then she goes and digs down that rabbit hole and finds, like, the craziest nonsense history stuff on those things. Yep, yep. So if you have a thought or a feeling or a Questions. question about those romance comics, Lois Lane comics, whatever it is, contact us, let us know, send us a message, comment on the post on the website, comment on the post on the Patreon, comment in the Discord. Becky might be in the Discord. I don't know. I sent her an invite. We'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously... She's interested to hear more people's thoughts and feelings and directions of uh, stuff for romance slash Lois Lane comics that she may have missed. Yes. So now, Todd, where would you like to begin with the books that we both read from this past week? I'm going to start with the book we were both looking forward to most, which was Uncanny X-Men number one, uh, written by Gail Simone and art by David uh, Marquez. Uh, this is obviously, you know, f falling out of all the Krakoa stuff, but, you know, a fresh start. 
And uh, it basically is the story of Rogue, Wolverine, and Gambit for the most part. But the book starts out with uh, a new character named Warden Ellis, who is, you know, ripping apart inside of the mansion because they're going to turn the mansion into a prison for mutants. And we get to see that the the first... Uh, what would you call it? Prisoners there, but we don't know who it is. But I do like the bit because Gail Simone does a good job of it, of uh, basically telling us that this new Ward Ellis is a bit of a fascist because the way she describes the people that she's going to emulate uh, pretty much, you know, sums it up. Uh, so then we get, you know, into the, the main bit of the story of Wolverine, who's having a crisis because he's, he met an old friend who's who's passing away and he feels like maybe he's cheated death and he ends up going to see rogue and gambit and they're trying to basically shoo a dragon out of this desert town um and you know it's a nice touch that they all meet up and they're they're having a good time but naturally they're x-men and it goes sideways and so they they face off and it's a cool bit where the dragons kind of got a bit of mysticism to him because he has an ar- an arcane artifact, uh, and he may kind of dip into the insecurities of Rogue because there's a bit even before the dragon where she hints at something and we find out later what it was, and it's all her insecurities, and he kind of foretells them something before Gambit finally through his you know. The only way Gambit could do it kind of makes a deal with the dragon. And, you know, that's going to come back because the way they leave it, you know, it's open-ended. And uh, they end up getting... uh, And I'll say this as as I'm here. If this book ended right here, it was very touching and I would be 100% fine with it. But it goes on because obviously it's an oversized number one. And then they get the call to go to basically, and they even say it in the book, as a make-a-wish program for mutants. And uh, they meet this this kid who's sick, and he kind of has a, a moment, and it ends up foretelling something that maybe the dragon did. So it's all kind of like coming together. And then I'm not going to get too much into it because I don't want to spoil it, but I have a blackened curmudgeon heart. <laughs> But when the when it happens and happens, and Rogue describes some things, and she describes the that what a no quiet on earth is like, Joe, dusty onions in the room. Do you know what I mean? Like I get goosebumps. I'm like, that's a hard bit, a hard bit to swallow. And then, Joe, I'm going to say it again. If they ended the book there with like a, an epilogue, like this is where the book's going. I would have been fine with it again, but they go off and have like a campfire at uh, Gambit's friend's house and they discuss the future of the X-Men. Like what's it all about? And a subplot that's running, not a subplot, but like an epilogue in the bit in the middle of the book where maybe somebody's hunting other mutants comes to fruition kind of at the end. And maybe Joe, just maybe we need the X-Men again. And this, like I said, if my, my only problem with this book is it it could have ended three times. If that's the only problem, that's a good problem. I love this. I'm not an X guy. I've never been an X guy. I'm a Gail Simone person. The art was gorgeous. Uh, this has me all in on an uncanny X-Men book, and I am shocked, Joe. Uh, yeah, and again, I'm not really sure how much um, I could g- address that you didn't already kind of go over there with everything that was built. And y- there were four different, I guess, paths that you could say that were kind of built upon, um, you know, whether it be the introduction of Dr. Warden, the battle with uh, the God Snake, the deal that Gambit makes with the God Snake, I guess, is included in there. You have mm-hmm. the Make a Wish kid, and then you have like what we get at the end of the book, right? Right. And this ties them all together. Some of them much more clear than others, and so forth. Um, not having read a regular X book, I did not have a ton of questions. But the only things that you know, and Rogue is the main character of this book. She's the narrator of everything that's more or less going on. Mm-hmm. It's still weird to see people call Rogue by her shoot name. Right, because when I was reading it, there no one knew her name other than Rogue. Right. 
And obviously, I haven't read an X book for a long time. And Rogue could touch people now? That was the other one that I didn't understand. But to be fair, they say that sh- that people were afraid to touch Rogue. But she doesn't have any open flesh. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's no flesh to flesh when she hugs. So I don't know if I'm missing something, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. So, but go ahead. I'm sorry. And I think the book works the best in that you have three likable people in here as your lead. Even the cameos, whether it be a one-page cameo like with Kitty Pride, and again, I don't think that's a spoiler, or because she's in the other book, um, a page spoiler with Cyclops and the bit that they all get to kind of rib on the square that is Scott Summers, and then Kurt... uh, Nightcrawler, and it's and again, I'll say this: it's weird. I don't up until this book, I did not know what Rogue's shoot name was. I don't call Nightcrawler Nightcrawler. I call him Kurt. Are you a Logan guy or a Wolverine? I, I'm I'm kind of interchangeable with those, right? Right. And then uh, it's Gambit, not Remy. It's Gambit, not Remy, and it's uh, Hank for Beast. Right. You know. Like so you said, I don't know if you said a I, kitty, kitty for shadow cat. Right. But she's had both interchangeably. And I don't know if it's blue tinted mutants that I call them by their shoot <laughs> names as opposed to their code names. More often than I call them, like I had to think, I'm like, oh, what's Kurt Wagner's sh- working name? Right. You know, really? You, you were having trouble with Nightcrawler? It took me like three seconds because I don't. Oh. I, in my notes, when I have them in my notes for the show, or I have in my notes for, like, Marvel Puzzle Quest stuff, I always have them as Kurt, right? Mm-hmm. It's Kurt. It's Kurt Wagner. Anyway, I think Gail picked a good crop of mutants to be the ones to lead us. And I say us being new readers, old readers, or whatever. Fan favorite, easily recognizable, dis- different enough, but alike enough that if they went on an adventure together, it's not a complete stretch. Um, you know, obviously, uh, and you know, and then who were introduced to her familiar faces as well outside of the last page of the book, of course, but that makes sense and we'll get there. Um, but I really like this as well. And I'm not going to sit here and say like, oh, have I been missing out on X books like this my whole life? And I'm going to say no, because there was a period of time where I was reading X books in the nineties when everybody was reading X books and I got away from them. And then I really liked, I still think the Grant Morrison, uh, Frank quietly run on, uh, new X-Men still holds up. And I think there was an uncanny X-Force run that was pretty halfway decent. Um, 15 years ago. I'm, I'm a Joss Whedon, uh, Cassidy X-Men run. Okay. Uh, and to a lesser extent, some mutant books when we were doing, was it the Colin Bunn Magneto book? That was absolutely amazing. Yes. That like if it wasn't a straight on X book, I was doing a few of the characters. The Greg Rucka Cyclops book when he was a kid, yes. that was a great book. But X proper, not too many that I try. It's tough. It's a, it's a yep. tough nut to crack for us. We've admitted it. But this book made it a lot easier. I, I I couldn't recommend this book high enough. You know. Yep. Yep. Except. Except. Oh, what? Todd, my blood was boiling. When I got to that last page and I see a definitive end of the book and it says to be continued and I'm like, all right, I got a full complete story for my dollars that I spent this comic book on. <gasps> and then I turned the page and I thought I had to go fire up my snip stamp app to figure out what happened in the rest of the book and scan that QR code and Todd my blood was boiling. I was seething. I had to get my special pills out just to be on the safe side. And and, and all it was was just some sketches of the characters in the book. So um, maybe these QR codes at the end of the books were a whole bunch of nothing. Now, luckily, this book, it wasn't an issue. I guess there were some books a couple of weeks ago where to get that last page that says to be continued on it, you had to scan a QR code. But mm-hmm. luckily, you didn't get that here. Yes, you did. Okay. There's a QR code at the back of this book. Yeah, but it wasn't like the end of the book. Like, I couldn't get the full story if I didn't scan the QR code. I just said I scanned it. Oh, okay. And all it was was just like, here's some additional art of the characters. Thanks for buying our book. And some narration. And okay. saying we're coming to tear it all down. 
listen, okay. There's been a lot of talk of these QR codes. And I, I was like, I, I, didn't, I didn't like the idea of it. I didn't like the idea of it for various reasons. And then when various people came out of the woodwork and said, oh, these people are mad. We're, you know, we're not taking away something. We're giving you something, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you know what? Fine. You could tell me like I'm, I'm stupid and I'm old and I don't like this stuff. But don't tell me you're giving me something. When I have to scan something and I get a page that's part of the book, a page that you're going to put in the trade, the trade is, it's going to be in there, but I don't get it. And I was talking with DJ about this today. And I go, when you buy the individual issues, if it doesn't sell well, you don't get a trade, right? With normal things. Now, DJ laughed at me. He goes, uh, uncanny X-Men by these creative teams is going to need your help to get it. I go, I get it. But it, you know, bad precedent in, in, in other books. And they're like, oh, well, they're, they're not taking anything away from you. Joe, what was that QR code printed on? Was it printed, printed on, on the back inside of, cover, or was it a page in the book? It was a page in the book. If you're going to give me the QR code on a page, just give me the page. Go, oh, well, you're going to be able to keep the QR code forever and go to the book. Joe, are you going to trust that Marvel's going to support that QR code for the, for the rest of eternity, for the rest of my life, so at least two years? You know what I mean? Like two years, three years, four years, five years out. So I don't get that page. And that's just the only thing. And normally that wouldn't bother me, but there was like kind of like briefer, like, oh, we're giving you something and you're mad about the way we're giving it to you. No, yes, I'm mad about that because you're giving it physically to the people who buy the trade. Why Why can't I? Have? Well, it, well, it dispels spoilers. Okay, that's a valid argument. But, but if it's such a great idea, why did you all of a sudden go, oh, we're not doing it again after these three issues of X-Men? We're not doing it again. It's because it blew up in your face. And people didn't like it like me. And like I said, the only reason I didn't like it is because people told me that I was being grumpy or stupid for not liking it. And that made me even matter when I was kind of okay with it in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I just, I thought I had it out of my system today, Joe, and I don't have it out of my system. But I guess maybe this is therapeutic on the show. Uh, and again, it wasn't, if the last page that we saw. Mm hmm the to be continued page was only accessible through the QR code, mm -hmm. I'd be with you. Right. It's fine. They tried and they failed. The moral of the story is never try. There you go, Homer. <laughs> <sighs> so, hey, uh, you want to talk about absolute power number two? Yeah, you could do that while I get my heart rate down. All right, Absolute Power number two, written by Mark Wade, uh, art by Dan Mora. This is the continuation of the big crossover uh, in DC right now that is going to end up leading to uh, the DC All In stuff that's coming up here in October. Um, now, I will say there is not a ton of crossover stuff with these books, mm -hmm. and it's not. So sometimes I read stuff out of order. And I think sometimes they need to do just a little bit better job of letting you know, like, hey, this happened here and that happened there. And they do it for some stuff, but they don't do it for an, a lot of other stuff. Like, I know from Absolute Power 1 that Superman got shot because they took his powers. And I know that's why he's in uh, the old school 90s black power suit. Right. But he just shows up in issue two with it. You read Superman 16, you get a little bit more explanation as the whys and the hows, and then maybe some information as to maybe why Superman shouldn't be in this issue. Um, so it's not a huge crossover. There's not a ton of other stuff that you have to read, but sometimes the stuff doesn't exactly line up the way that it should. Um, but I think, I hope, fingers crossed, that this does not fall into Marvel's Siege crossover where the miniseries itself was just highlights of what was happening, and you really had to read, like, all the other Avengers books and everything else to get the real story. We're only two issues in of a four-issue miniseries. I don't think we're going to get that, because a ton of stuff happened in this book. Right. Uh, um, uh, go ahead. I would say, the only thing that I would say when it comes to the reading order is, if a book comes out, like, if a book comes out, that's the one you read first that week. 
other than that, uh, if it's Absolute Power, the miniseries itself, read that first and then any other books that have the Absolute Power tie-in on it. I think you'll be fine because they do have an Absolute Power uh, reading order online, Mm -hmm. and that's the kind of way I look at it. It's like, oh, so Batman and Superman came out this week along with Absolute Power to read Absolute Power first, then read Superman and Batman or whatever. The next time it'll be absolute power number three and green arrow and something else is like just read three first and then the tie-in books and i think you'll be okay that being said i'm I'm enjoying the story i'm not blown away by absolute power yet we'll see we got you know a couple more issues to go so there was a lot of good moments in this yeah this issue i thought you know we we get the information just the crux of it is that currently 80 percent of the dc superheroes have either been depowered captured or both Mm-hmm. Um, there's a bit, of course, where the superheroes are arguing who should be in charge, <laughs> and Dick Grayson gets a great moment in this book. Um, there's a bit where they're going to go out and try to take on the Amazos, and the main line Justice League members put on their Justice League tr- tactical suits, where at a different time, in a different world, those toys would be on shelves right alongside these issues. What you're saying, and the Flash would have a little hover cycle too. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, the main crux is that Jonathan Kent, Superboy, Clark's son, was one of the people that was captured, and he gets turned into a Brainiac Amazo hybrid. And Waller, knowing how Superman is going to react to that, Superman is going to try to save his son. And obviously the sun is set up as a decoy for her to try to get Superman to be a cyborg, brainiac, a mazo, whatever. Mm -hmm. Maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't. All the superheroes are holed up at the Fortress of Solitude. Um, Superman has a bunch of fail safes. No pun intended there. Uh, He has a bunch of contingency plans. Um, it's very interesting to see what those contingency plans are. I don't want to give away too, too much of it. I know Todd says not blowing, blowing you away, but we've been on for the last like couple, two, three big DC crossover things mm-hmm. and it's Mark Wade. I'm enjoying it. Everybody yep. feels like themselves. Yep. I will say the one thing that intrigues me and I'm, I can't spoil it. So we'll see where it goes. Next issue is Ollie's plan and what he digs up and might use. Yeah. And it may come because this I can say is that uh, I can't think of Connor is running around in the in the GA book as the new Green Arrow because Ollie's with uh, Waller and he's like, oh, well, now's the the time has come. And I'm like, is he just going to use this stuff or is he going to take up a new mantle, which would be awesome. And I have a whole like like dream sequence where this could go because of what he's using. And I'm like, this could be very, very interesting. Um, so that's the one thing that has me hooked is all the all these stuff mm-hmm. or like super hook. If that makes any sense. For sure. Uh, I'm enjoying it. Um, definitely check it out. You know, if you're looking for a big mainline DC crossover and again, that's the thing that's going to lead into all in. So if all in right. is intriguing you in any way, shape or form, you know, go check out absolute power just to see how they get there when they get there in October. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's what we read from this past week. Let's get into what we're looking forward to coming out this week. If you head over to longboxheroes.com, every Tuesday around noon, we put up the pull post, which is a link to a link to all the books that are coming out this week. Whether you get your books in print, whether you get them digitally, whether you get them sent to your home, however it is, you get your books before Warren, before Arm know what's coming out this week. Todd and I attempt to guess what the other is most looking forward to coming out this week. Todd is currently in the lead over me with one correct guess. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a tough week. That's why I said loyalties will be tested. There's some big creators that we're fans of here. And looking to see what is coming out. Um, Our lists are relatively similar for the most part. Um, I could really go either way. I'm not filibustering. I think the book that you're most looking forward to coming out this week is the Houses of the Unholy graphic novel. It is the Houses of the Unholy hardcover, yes. Is that the book you're looking forward to most? Uh, that is also the book I'm most looking forward to coming out this week as well. Um, you know, I, I mentioned it before. Believe. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> that X Factor number one by Mark Russell is probably going to be pretty good, right? Yep, yep. And, you know, we have uh, the uh, the Barfly book, too. So. Right. Kyle Stark's Barfly, another issue of the Gail Simone Action Comics is coming out this week. Um, I love me some Dick Tracy. The last issue of uh, Rainbow Rowell's Sensational She-Hulk comes out this week. But it only happens once every three to four months. But when Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips put out one of their books, it's mm-hmm. almost like Saga level. I think it they is. know not to put them out the same week as Saga because they know. I think they do too. It's like, let's have two big weeks at a comic shop instead of having uh, us undercutting each other, if that makes any right. sense. Let's put all the new Ghost Machine books out on the same day. Well, the fir- they I still stand by that as an event one for the first one. You have those people in there like, oh, I'll get all them and try them. And then after that, you stagger them so you don't overwhelm the pocketbook each week. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in that rollout model. Yep. Uh, so while you're over at longboxheroes.com, of course, be sure to check out past episodes of this show that you're listening to right now, past episodes of Longbox Heroes After Dark, and of course, our current ongoing Todd and Joe Have Issues, where we are rereading all of Gail Simone's Secret Six. This is issue 16, which is the beginning of a new story arc, but kind of, sort of, almost works as a one-off. Mm-hmm. Um, it is more or less introducing Black Alice to the team and to the readers. Yep. Uh, we get a bit at the beginning where Deadshot and Catman are breaking out a guy from prison, a man by the name of Enos Kurtz, who's a very, very bad man, Todd. Yes, he is. So bad that I think they might have edited some of his stories out of the upcoming Marvel and DC omnibuses. Oh, no. Um, But there's a bit of a good misdirect, because even rereading this at the time, and this is something that, you know, Todd and I read before. I read a couple times. Todd read once. So it's one of those things where it exists in my mind, but, like, the the pages need to be turned um, a little bit slower, because I'm reliving a lot of the stuff. So when Deadshot and Catman break this man out of prison, and they say that he's got a mysterious benefactor, I was fearing the worst. I'm like, oh, our boys are back on the side of the the wrong. But they're on the side of the wrong for the right reasons, in that the men- mysterious benefactor was one of uh, Mr. Kurtz's victims. And they do give, uh, was it Julie was the little girl's name? Mm-hmm. Uh, they do give, or Katie, my apology. They do give Katie's dad a little bit of a pep talk that if you're really going to go through with this torturing, maiming, and killing... Most people do it this way. You should really do it this way. And I would take them at their word because they're professionals. Okay, Joe, just describing that, all the hair on my body is standing up. (laughs) Because, okay, now I've discussed this, that like gore and stuff in in, in comics I can handle because it's drawn and it's not like it's vivid or blah, blah, blah. So that's why I don't watch a lot of the horror movies that you want to get. Even the ones that you may have been pushing on social media today, I'm not going to watch. Um, but Catman describing how to make it worse to this gentleman. First, the bit of the guy, I can't do it. And you're like, oh, okay, well, you know, maybe Catman and Deadshot are going to take him out and be like, all right, we, you know, mercy. So you don't have to do it. No, the fact that you're going to want to do this and here's how to enjoy it and how to make it worse. And when he explains how to make it? It it I uh it's, my stomach got queasy, Joe. Reading something like that—that's a brilliant bit of dialogue for someone who is a delicate soul like me, <laughs> Joe. Uh, so Black Alice is watching this the whole time. She makes the pitch for her to join the crew. They're not a hundred percent sold on it. Scandal still with them, even though she was kicked out of the group. I'm not really sure how that works. Yeah, I think uh, just the father figure. He's keeping her around, but she's not on the team. Okay. And then if you're unfamiliar with Black Alice, she has the ability to uh, replicate uh, the powers and even the looks at times of any sort of the magic characters in the world of the DC Universe. Mm -hmm. And what constitutes as magic is kind of a wide net when it comes to things because... Mm -hmm. You know, Banshees, uh, Jeanette is technically a magical, mystical creature. 
So she does this up close and personal to Jeanette, and it takes the entire team to attempt to take her down. And it seems as though begrudgingly uh, they take this 16-year-old girl onto the team. Yes. I'll say this. Um, where they go to try to lose a 16 year old is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, Thursday nights at this place, I would be one of my favorite nights. I'll <laughs> say. Um, and the bit where like Jeanette comes into this club and the quote <laughs> is, well, first of all, Bath calls it distasteful and I'm like, all right, that's funny. And then Jeanette's like, very Look at the amateurs giving it away for free when they can make so much more by denying it to their clientele. And I'm like, there's some interesting uh, things people would be into that Jeanette is describing. And I just, I love it. It's all, I love the way this book, you know, in 2000, whatever, skirts like the skeezy areas and it's like so close it gives me what i need to understand it without going overboard but man oh man i'm gonna i think i might have said it before and i'll say it again secret six was the thirstiest book of that decade (laughs) do you know what i'm saying so good right and and catman knows his maiming and killing Jeanette knows her uh manipulation if you will Mm -hmm. And then I like the bit that they're setting the groundwork uh, because uh, Black Alice, they're like talking. He's like, I'm in, blah, blah, blah. And Bane's the the guy in charge. And they're like, if I want in, I'm in. And she's like, besides, the guy with the scars is all kind of hot. And she's talking about Ragdoll, Joe. And I think maybe that'll be an interesting little relationship (laughs) if things goes on. I'm just saying, we'll have to wait and see. Issues to come, you know? For sure. So again, this is a fun issue. Again, it's the beginning of a new storyline, as mentioned, but it's more so a one-off, really, because next week we're not going to be reading an issue of Secret Six. <gasps> we're going to be reading an issue of Suicide Squad number sixty-seven. Wow. Now I know what you're thinking. Self wasn't Suicide Squad canceled back in the late eighties, early nineties with issue sixty-six. It was Joe. Oh, uh, it was. So. Secret Six is crossing over with Blackest Night. Blackest Night did a bit hmm. um, where, you know, obviously it crossed over with a bunch of the books, has crossed over with the Green Lantern and related books, has its own ongoing miniseries, but then they did a series of one-shots, which were the last issue of past canceled series, mostly were standalones, mostly, hmm. except for this one. This yep. one is as much an issue of Secret Six as the previous 16 issues that we read, the issues of Villains United, the issues of Birds of Prey, everything yep. that we read. It's in the omnibus. It's written by Gale and John Ostrander. It 1,000% counts. I agree. I agree 100%. And I love like this era of stuff because the great thing about Secret Six as a book right here is we're going and we're walking into – stuff that we didn't even realize was coming if you didn't know it at the time. It's like when you get to the Battle for the Cowl and now you get to Blackest Night, it's like we're walking up to it, we're going to get a taste of it, and then we leave. Like we always said, the way she weaves us in and out of this stuff is absolutely fantastic because you're not like, oh, I'm I'm just waiting until, you know, it's going to be a Blackest Night issue next month, you know? No, because you don't see it coming ever. You just get it and then you enjoy it and you move on. That's all. And that's what we'll be doing here with that next week. Um, of course, uh, while you're over at Longbox Heroes, be sure to check out our store. Get shirts and pins and stickers with our fancy logo on them. Shoot me a line. I'll hook you up. Uh, you can make any and all of your purchases through our eBay affiliate link. Mm-hmm. Um, when you uh, This page contains affiliate links for eBay. We may receive a small commission on purchases that you make. You could use the affiliate link at any time you want to buy anything on eBay and support the show at the same time. Yeah. But the best and easiest way to support us outside of just your general listening habits would be to sign up for our Patreon. Patreon.com slash Longbox Heroes. As little as a dollar and one cent a month. You can get two bonus shows from Todd and myself. One is Previewing the Past, where we look at 30 years ago this month's previews catalog. Uh, The other is Comic Book Oddities, where we look at some of the lesser-known, much maligned, failed attempts pre-Marvel Cinematic Universe 
uh, movies, TV shows, pilots, etc. Uh, we're fresh off Todd's all-time favorite, <laughs> which was Legends of the Superhero, the challenge, Legend of the Superheroes, the challenge slash the roast. Yes, nailed it, Joe. And then this month, we're going to be recording the 1996 Cinemax original Vampirella movie. Yes, sir. And if every word in that sentence I said makes no sense to you, it don't make no sense to me neither. Right. And I think there's even versions without subtitles, Joe. Yes. And we'll we'll link that up, of course, when the show goes up. If a lot of this stuff is available through not your normal streaming services, nobody wants to claim it. And it just exists on Vimeo, Daily Motion, whatever. We'll be sure to let you know where you can find those so you can watch and listen or listen then watch to see if what we watched was real sometimes it doesn't feel like it is but sometimes it it feels all too real Joe. yes sometimes it feels all too real and again of course any level that you sign up for the patreon on is going to give you access to our discord uh it's going to give you access to the full scans expertly done professional grade looking scans of the previous catalogs that we are discussing and would be discussing on episodes of preview the past uh everything is available as like its own rss feed as well if you're one of those types of people that like to point your pod catcher at one place we put both the shows Longbox heroes and Longbox heroes after dark up there even if you're a free person you know, and you just want to have one RSS feed for two of the shows, you got that. If you want to have one RSS feed for the three of the shows, Longbox Heroes, Longbox Heroes After Dark, and the Patreon show, you can get that through the Patreon if you're subscribed at one of the higher level, you know, the, the, the paid amounts. And $5 and up, folks, of course, are going to get After Dark two days before everyone else, so you can listen to everything in the correct listening order. And you're going to get the bonus shows two weeks before everyone else. So you could have bragging rights and different conversation groups to discuss your favorite moments from those shows. Mm -hmm. And I go into it a little bit more in depth over on After Dark this week, tease, tease. Uh, But the Patreon iOS Apple device changes is a little blown out of proportion. Um, It's essentially just going to affect you if you are a new signing up person to a Patreon after November 1st. And you're doing so through the Patreon app, which admittedly really stinks. Um, but if you're doing it through the iOS, be prepared. Um, you know, as a new subscriber to stuff, you might get charged more. As it stands right now, existing folks aren't going to be affected, only new folks. But a lot can change in three months. Yep. And if we get notified, we'll let you know. True bit. Um, also, before we get into uh, wrapping up discussion of Batman Cape Crusader, there's only three weeks until kickoff. Uh, it's time to sign up for our pigskin pickums. The link to do that is pinned at the top of the page over at longboxheroes.com. Uh, we already have about 18 people signed up. It's for the whole network, soon to be named network. We're trying to let everyone know about it. The more the merrier, the more that you can compare and contrast your picks. It's just straight picks. It's not betting. That's on you. There's no money line. That's on you. Yep. This is uh, entertainment purposes only. Right. And I think we're in our, what, 11th year of doing this? 10th God, year of doing this? It's been a long time. Something like that. And, Joe, listen, I say this because I always like looking at the names that pop into our group. Yes. And, and, and I'll say this. If I can't win, I, I, if I can't win, Number two that I want, or number three that I want to see win after me at one is boy big boycott big pumpkin. I'm always for people who boycott big pumpkin, but boy oh boy, at the top of my list, a numero uno with a bullet. If I can't win, Commander Ace Hunter, whoever you are, <laughs> you have my blessing to pass me and take it all because it when it comes to picking football teams. Deeds, not words, Joe. Has words signed up yet or no? I don't think so. I don't think he signed up last year. I think uh, he got ticked off or something. Okay. Maybe you could contact him again. By that, maybe I mean, I'll reach out to him. However, I do. Right, like the bathroom mirror. <laughs> um. So yeah, make sure to sign up for that. Only three weeks until the kickoff starts. Don't forget to do your picks every week, or just do your picks all one day for the entire season. Then you never have to think about it again. There you go. 
Right. Be a maniac. Uh, so let's get into the discussion, and you know, obviously, we're gonna not worry about the last two episodes of the season unless they really knock my socks off when I watch them. But uh, I ended up watching like five more episodes, six more episodes mm-hmm. of the Batman Cape Crusader thing over the last couple uh, over the last week, right? Right. And I liked the first two episodes that we watched. You know, I really liked the Clayface episode a little bit more just because the new design on the clay face thing, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but the of the ones that I watched here, of the six, I really liked episodes three, four, and five. The Catwoman one, the Firebug one, and the mm-hmm. Harley Quinn one. Right. Though, and those were the, well, the two, because I was lesser on the Harley Quinn, but I still liked, you know, everything that comes here. But to me, we peak at Kiss of the Catwoman and Night... Night of the Hunters. Um, I like the bit with Catwoman uh, that she's more of a like not not even like the 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 alternate version of Batman, kind of like the Bizarro that she has her own maid who is absolutely hysterical. She that the maid is more like Alfred from animated series, the way she talks to Catwoman. So I absolutely love it, and Catwoman's just like a femme fatale who's not really great at it. And I like when the episode's over and all it turns out with the maid and Catwoman, but also like Bat- Batman's kind of like, oh, she's kind of nice. But I like the line at the end when she just, he just goes like, she was a distraction and a nuisance, like nothing taken seriously. Like I forget the word he actually uses, but it's almost insulting. To Catwoman. I, I think she's going to step up the game from here, but I, I, I like the way it is right now. She's more of, she, she she doesn't seem she's worthy of Batman. This Catwoman's definitely worthy of Slam Bradley if he shows up. <laughs> I loved all the design elements on Catwoman. Mm-hmm. Um, she was the most 40s of everything in this, like ripped right from those comics. Yep. The look, the design, the attitude, the car, all of it. Um, if uh, I love the stuff with the maid, as you had mentioned, and uh, I was half expecting King of Cats to show up. Of how forties <laughs> and fifties this episode was by her brother. Yes, that's no mention of the brother two. in this, but hopefully that's- next time she shows up, we'll get King of Cats. Right, season two, they're saving King of Cats for. Yeah. Uh, so well, then we get. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say next because you're going to transition to that. Is by far my favorite episode of the whole series is the Firebug one. I like the Firebug one uh, called Night of the Hunters. Essentially, they're tr- the Gotham, uh, the GCPD are corrupt. Mm-hmm. And they have a task force to try to get Batman. And based on the events of the Catwoman episode, Montoya gets taken off the head of the task force and uh, Bullock and Flask get put in charge of it. Mm -hmm. And everyone in the force is like, well, we're going to stage a whole bunch of things to try to lure Batman out. But of course, Batman's smarter than that. So they decide and, you know, very poorly, Flask and Bullock, uh, we're going to find someone who's one of these costumed weirdos and we're going to accidentally release him back onto the streets. Right. That'll definitely lure out the Batman. And then that we'll just capture the Batman. No fuss, mm-hmm. no muss, right? That won't go wrong at all. Oh, and it goes horribly wrong. Man, when the Firebug gets his costume because they left it in the trunk um, and it was open because the latch was busted, you know, all the stuff that they just left, the, you know, just explained to him so he could get away. But the way he sees people, oh my god, like that they're just flames, burn them when all he, in the words of the Mad King. No, yeah, it's fantastic. When, he, like, he's out and he's in his full gimmick, and he comes upon, like, people frolicking the streets, children, pl- children playing, and he sees even the children playing just as living flames. Oh, that was a distressing moment for this show. Right, and the fact that he's this like short, little, pudgy, thick glasses, un- like 
like if you walked up to him in a bar and he like shoved you, it would just be like, oh, it's on, little man. Like I'm just gonna crush you. But to know the fact that he's that dangerous because of the like, like it makes it all the more. I don't know how to explain what I'm explaining. It's just very off putting. This little guy who's gonna, I'm gonna burn them all, and you're just like, oh. Reminds me of uh, the who was the guy uh, in Backdraft. I can't think of his name. He was uh, he just recently passed away. Um, the actor, <sighs> not helping. But there was a scene no. in that, like wherever you see like an arsonist and the people who have like the love of the fire, they they have like a, a way about them that's just so distressing, Joe. Uh, so those two episodes were really good. I liked the Harley Quinn episode. I like the redesign, a little bit more menacing, um, re- reimagining of Harley Quinn in the previous episodes. They were maybe tiptoeing around um, uh, Harley and Renee's relationship. Yeah, and in this episode, it just comes right to the forefront, mm-hmm. um, which I thought was very interesting. Um and again, this is not a kid show by any stretch of the imagination. It's TV 14. It's on a streaming service, so it's not on over the air network. Um, but this episode definitely felt like the most fetish heavy episode I've ever seen of anything in my entire life. Mm-hmm. Whether it be adult babies, whether it be tangentially furries, oh. whether it be S and M stuff, whether it be tickling stuff. Yaki um, wrote I this did episode. Check, I did check the credits to see if Yaki was a consultant. He was not. Mm-hmm. Um, but I liked it. I liked this episode. I, I know a lot of people were up in arms over the redesign of the over the Harley Quinn um, costume, at least. But I still thought this was a really good episode. Yep, that actor was Donald Sutherland, by the way. Um, so I, I like this episode. I'm a stick like. <sighs> Like they're never gonna do to me, Mister Freeze, better than Heart of Ice, and they're never gonna do uh, Harley Quinn better than Arlene Sorkin in those a- old animated series. So that's the bar you have to get over, and it and this didn't get over it for me, but I really liked it, and I actually like the redesign of the costume. Looks more like you know a playing card thing, whatever, whatever you want, more of a Mardi Gras, whatever. But I liked it. But I'm with you. As I was watching this, I was like, ooh, is this like, you know, HBO late night shows talking about things kind of a deal? Because it was. It was very heavy in some of those things that you said. Right. And the next two episodes were fine. I was shocked to see them go so quickly into, like, supernatural elements in the Batman show. Mm Mm-hmm. With a legitimate ghost and a legitimate vampire, without them coming right out and saying it's a ghost and a vampire. Right. I was shocked to see the guy who helps Batman take down the gentleman ghost was uh, Papa Midnight from Hellblazer. Mm -hmm. Like, that, like, because I know the character, and that kind of shocked me. I'm like, that character first appears in what would become the Vertigo Hellblazer ran for 300 issues. Issue one, and I'm like that name sounds very familiar because they're not calling him Papa Midnight in the book, I don't think, or in the comic. I was like, no, I looked it up. I was like, yeah, that's him. And it's just funny to me to see Batman getting a John Constantine villain in like 1940s, if that makes any sense. I didn't love the redesign on Gentleman Ghost. He needs Mm -hmm. to be a monocle and a top hat, not a Civil War guy. I I agree with you. That's one of them that I didn't like. But I did like the the vamp the vampire one. Mm-hmm. Did you get the gist of all the people, the kids that were? Yep, taken? they were all Robins. Yeah, that had me. That kind of popped me when it was like Richard, and then Jason. What and was then Dickie, like when you get Jace? What? It was Dicky. Yep. Jace, Jason. But my friends call me Jace. Yep. Stephanie, and they come right out and say Stephanie Brown, and then uh, Carrie. Was there a Tim there, too? No, there was not a Tim, because even at the end, there was only the four of the kids in the thing. Okay. But I but like, then, like the Carrie even has the slingshot. Yeah, th- I was like, this is fantastic. Yeah. This is fantastic. Though, I do think, I honestly think they should have went with, I can't think of the girl's name, who the character is, um, to be a little bit older, because she would be a good, uh, different 
female attraction to Noctura. That's Nocturna. That's the name of the character who kind of was a love interest for Batman when they kind of put Catwoman on the side in a certain like era of comics. I would have liked to see her a little older so you could have another character. Like she's the love interest in this series, if that makes any sense, if you're going to make Catwoman a buffoon. Yeah. And we skipped an, epi- uh, an episode in there, the one where there's the hit out on Commissioner Gordon. And uh, I wish there was less onomatopoeia and more uh, Floyd Lawton in the episode. Yeah. Eh. Uh, the the only other thing I, I guess is even it was a couple episodes earlier when they were doing the roll call at the police station and they mentioned Jim Corrigan was one of the cops. Yeah. I'm like, oh, he's, he's, the, he's the one that's going to turn. He's this, and maybe he'll become the specter because we have magic in here. Yeah, yeah. And did you know what? Did you notice the name of the sleazy photographer that runs through this series? No. His name's Eel O'Brien. Oh, get out of town. Yeah. Okay. I'll say this. I'll say this, right? He's like in the early episode where I think it's the Catwoman episode, he shows up and I have the subtitles on, right? And. They call him Bill, like, he calls him Eel O'Brien, right? In the cartoon. I went back and and rewound it like 50 times. But in the subtitles, they call him Bill or Will O'Brien. It's something. It's wrong. And then later, it's like, they mention it, and he's Eel O'Brien. So I I was like, oh, I'm wondering if he's ever going to be Plastic Man, you know? I thought that was kind of a nice little nod. Because they're rolling in other characters with names, and they're not... Like, his eel was just a criminal back in the day, but this is a sleazy photographer. I, so I don't know what where anything could go when they use these names, if that makes any sense. But it's still cool to see them being relatively similar to who they are as their DC Universe counterpoints. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm with you. More Deadshot uh, is what we need. But maybe this is just the beginning, you know? Right. And we only got two more episodes left. Of course, the the one that I finished up with, um, the Nocturne episode with the the Robins and everything else is when Harvey Dent gets two faced at the mm-hmm. end of the episode. Yep. And I have a feeling these last two episodes are going to be two face, which is yep. you know what everything's kind of been building toward. Right. And one thing that's related but not to this cartoon is uh, I would like to see DC do a tie in recently because I I know you don't you fast forward through a lot of the commercials because you DVR everything when you watch TV. Yeah, but the new uh, advertising thing for Oreos is that they kind of use the Oreo cookies like Two Face does with the coin. So it's like, oh, uh, like just the one commercial is, and it's in the eight uh, or in the nineties. Is like, uh, should we invest in boy bands? Like that's what we're gonna kind of do. And they're like, I don't know, it seems cheesy. And they'll pick up an Oreo, and in your hand, you you know, when you grab each side of the Oreo and you twist, and it comes apart. They go. If there's cream on the left side, we're gonna back the uh, we're gonna back uh, boy bands. And if the cream's on the right side, we're not. So it's like a decision maker, a magic eight ball. And I would love to see Two Face lose his coin and have to do this with Chacos instead. Oh my goodness! <laughs> would be I, I Joe this, I saw that commercial and immediately my brain went to like Martian Manhunter, Two Face, Chacos because you can't use Oreos. Like oh my god, this is this would be. Awesome, but they might get a cease and desist order. I was uh, notified before we started recording that in a joint venture, Coca-Cola is releasing an Oreo-flavored Coke Zero. Yes. And Oreo is releasing a Coke Zero-flavored cookie. You got your Coke Zero in my Oreo, and you got your Oreo in my Coke Zero. Yeah. I wonder if a good friend of the show, Kyle Starks, will be eating those. I hope so. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like I said, you know, if if in the last two episodes knock my socks off, we'll 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 put them back on and we'll talk about it next yeah. week. How about that? Sure, because what do we have between now and what? I don't even know. Nothing. So technically, like Beetlejuice is the next genre thing up. I know you'll be going yep. to see it with all your Fanta cans. Yes, I will be. I'll, uh, I love Fanta cans. Though I will admit, I probably won't see it opening week. Because I talked to somebody, we're probably going between like in the next two or three weeks. I'll be going to see uh, Alien Romulus. I'm really jacked about that because I'm an Alien Predator movie guy. So 
I'm giving you a heads up. I hear it's gory. You know what? Um, I I don't know because I gory because any of the aliens movies were slightly gory and I could handle that. So we'll see. But I know this is going to be a hard R alien movie. Yeah. But yeah, I will see that and I will see uh, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Yep. So the next things after that that we have is the HBO Max Penguin uh, TV show starring uh, Colin Farrell spinning out of the Matt Reeves Batman movies. Right. And then uh, after that is the uh, Agatha show. Oh, okay. So that, but that's not, that's October-ish. That's like a month and a, that's like five weeks away. Okay. Yeah, we it's got like some third time. week of September. Yeah, we got time. So we got a break between now and then got it. Yeah, exactly. I think that's uh, so everything. He, that is everything. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. This was episode 723 of Longbox Heroes. For Todd, this is Joe saying, catch you all here next week. Remember, be a faucet, not a drain. You're listening to the soon-to-be-named network, the Lamborghini of Podcast Networks. The Rob is a long box hero. The Rob is a long box hero. He gives us five five stars.